This presentation is entitled Prestige, Mobilizing a Bold Media Corpus by Matthew Russell Lee. It is presented on July 21st, 2021, and it is the defense for a Master of Arts in Applied Linguistics with a concentration in Descriptive Linguistics. Before we get started, the um, defense copy of the thesis document and the presentation are available here, mattgyverlee.github.io hashtag thesis. Once you click there, it'll open up a page and you'll be able to see those. So the challenge is that language documentation is first and foremost for the community. And we as linguists only get the privilege of studying these languages and cultures with the minimal expectation that we will provide something they can use. In reading the greatest hits of language documentation, some form of revitalization, exploitation, or mobilization of the results is nearly always the stated goal, but the detailed discussions and recommendations always tend to trail off after archiving. To give you an idea of where this talk is going, the research question of this thesis is this. In language documentation, how can the unique orally annotated content of a bold corpus be made interactive and directly serve the needs of the language community? The way things are currently, we're almost there. The bold, basic oral language documentation methodology guides a language and culture, doc culture documentation team through the planning, collection, annotation, and archival of an orally annotated corpus. And you can use SIL specialized language documentation software tool, Say More, which assists with every step of the bold methodology. But bold and Say More leave out how one might mobilize bold data within the community. Here is a heavily abridged overview of language documentation in bold. So language documentation, Himmelman, is the process of capturing, preserving, and making available resources that catalog a language's use. So what are you, what are you collecting? The core of a language documentation is generally understood to be a corpus of audio and or video materials with time-aligned transcription, annotation, and translation into the language of wider communication and relevant metadata on context and use of the materials. So Berger and others added and culture to and made it language and culture documentation and that expands the emphasis beyond the spoken and written word that is traditionally um, thought of and includes documentation of anthropological elements such as dress, rituals, artifacts, things like that. For the next few minutes we're going to dive into Austin's five activities of language documentation in the context of bold. So that's recording, transfer to a data management environment, adding value, archiving, and mobilization. So the first activity is recording of media and metadata that will serve both the linguist and the community. So the big ones here, elicited lists, so that's gonna be a word list, communicative events of all types in, that, that you can think of, analytical discussions where you discuss some of the content probably in the previous um, sections, possibly written works by, by local authors, events, activities, images, and about everything descriptive metadata. The next step is transfer to a data management environment and say more is the, um, is the tool that fills this role and can facilitate these tasks. Gathering the data, converting the data if necessary, organizing the data, doing the annotation, oral and text, checking coverage, and archiving. The third activity is adding value. Now traditionally, that would be through written transcription in the orthography or the, or the IPA, written translation into a language of wider communication, or interline interlinearization. But our ability to record and archive language materials outstrips the ability to make their contents accessible through transcription, which means expect delays. So the extreme workload of written translation is called the transcription bottleneck. And that means that large amounts of language documentation content may never be ready for distribution because nobody's finished the annotation. At best, the unfinished content may be hidden in the archive obscurely 
and at worst, staff and resources can be reassigned and the unfinished content may be lost altogether. So BOLD, or the Basic Oral Language Documentation Methodology, partially alleviates the transcription bottleneck by proposing a clever process of streamlined oral annotation that can be completed in hours, not weeks. So a short history of BOLD. Uh, it was originally, it was inspired by Woodbury and uh, Bukio, and it was outlined in a presentation by Gary Simons in 2008. It was updated by Will Ryman, Brenda Berger, uh, through courses and other works, uh, other articles. Stephen Bird created an offshoot of BOLD called BOLD PNG that focused on involvement of local linguists and using inexpensive equipment. But the most complete description of BOLD is found in the Language, Documentation, uh, Language and Culture Documentation Manual of 2019. So oral annotation goes like this. Here's an example. You record, with permission, a eulogy of the chief at a funeral um, from three rows back. Later, you segment the data and sit down with a language consultant in, in a near studio setting. Your informant respeaks each segment slowly and carefully in the language. Next, the informant translates each phrase into the national language. So you have oral recording, segmentation, careful speech transcription, and oral translation. After oral, oral annotation, you are left with three tracks. You have the original, careful, and translation. The careful speech version can be considered as a secondary, primary written or recording for written transcription or instrumental analysis. You can use it for all the same purposes that you would have used the original, but it's gonna be slower, clearer, and easier to understand. You also will have the oral translation uh, that is done clear and slow in a, record, or in a studio sort of uh, quality. With BOLD, an hour of recording can be collected, orally annotated, and ready to archive in actually less than 16 hours, estimated by Berger. Returning to Austin's tasks, the fourth task is archiving. So Saymore facilitates the archival of quality primary recordings to MD, to REAP, to other uh, archives. That full metadata and the annotations, of course, and it preserves those aspects of the language and cultural heritage for the long term. After completing all the steps in bold, not forgetting informed consent, all these layers of content are ready for archiving. So when I say ready for archiving, uh, that really means that it's ready for researchers. From that source, future research researchers will be able to access the content. The XML metadata that's included can be used to find the specific content you're looking for. The source video and audio is of course available in whatever quality. The original careful and translation recordings are stored in archival formats in WAVE, and they're ready for instrumental analysis or further transcription. And the written transcriptions themselves are stored in Elon's EF format, Elon annotation format. As far as the community is concerned though, the resources might as well be displayed in the bottom of a locked filing cabinet stuck in a disused laboratory with a sign on the door saying, Beware of the leopard. To give an example, here's an entry for an interesting story about a mermaid from Cameroon. For a person from this language community, unfortunately, it might be easier to find the mermaid herself than to gain access to and decode the annotation file in the archive. That again is in that XML EF format. And WAVE is, I mean, they're gonna be able to play it, but it's not really what they're expecting. Probably they're gonna to wanna to hear it in an MP3 and be able to use that. If archival really doesn't serve the community's needs now, what does? Well, Austin's fifth step is mobilization of language documentation data. Mobilization in language documentation means working with the speaker communities to produce products from language documentation that can be used to counter language endangerment. Unfortunately, mobilization is where BOLD currently starts to break down. To use Nathan's words, this thesis assumes that you hope that some of your fieldwork results will one day be applied to the maintenance, strengthening, or revitalization of the visited community's language. So the challenge is that there's no one-size-fits-all formula for language revitalization. If it was, it would be a lot easier. 
Mobilization is not a product that a linguist can produce because mobilization is in the hands and the desires of the community. As linguists, the least we can do for the community is to archive data in the formats that serve linguistic needs. A contribution many steps beyond would be to ensure that the community guides the choice of content from the beginning and that these curated treasures are made available in formats that the community is ready to use today to combat language endangerment. So, in the case of BOLD, how do you make the content that's cleverly hidden through language documentation best practices mobile, more friendly, and inviting to the community? When I look at the products of BOLD through the lens of mobilization, though, I see a deep potential, but how does a community use them to fight language endangerment? We have the documentation project. We have those source recordings. We have the metadata and the index, the oral transcriptions, the oral translations, and some written annotation. So during the documentation project, there's community sharing and dialogue. Sometimes younger folks in the uh, community are hearing stories from the culture for the first time because they're being spoken to be recorded. Uh, you're getting that raw record of experience from the source recordings. As soon as you add the metadata and the index, you have the media catalog. When you get to oral transcription, then you have, theoretically, some language and culture learning materials that you can use because you now have a slow and careful speech and a fast speech version of the same content. After you add oral translation, then you can start engaging the diaspora and you have something that can serve as a linguistic source and these uh, resources can go as wide as you want them to go or as wide as the community wants them to go. Once you get that written annotation or some sort of uh, generated annotation, then you get into further options with literacy resources, natural language processing corpora, and more. So Prestige is dedicated to language communities working across the world, striving and working to see their languages and cultures remain prestigious, vibrant, relevant, and full of life for generations to come. To make this work, the first process was to deconstruct the same or sessions, session folders, and pull them into Prestige. So that required scanning the files in the folder, and then reading the XML files, uh, specifically the EF file, which is the annotation file. As uh, each part was read in, it, uh, the tool created an to creates an internal timeline, and it imports the written transcriptions. Then it has to dig through the file names. Unfortunately, in Saymore, the uh, oral annotations are tagged with file names and not described in the XML files as I would expect them to be. But it's possible to read the file names and reconstruct where they're supposed to go and put them into the timeline. After that, I took all of the segments, chained them together, and created, uh, created two single MP3 files, one for the oral transcription and one for the, uh, for the oral translation and then loading all those files and the text into Prestige. Once all that has been done, the files load into Prestige. And so this is the Prestige prototype interface. Uh, you'll see that you've got the video in the corner, you have the subtitles, and you have these three tracks of audio along the bottom left side. And over on the right, you have the annotation window. We'll see a little bit deeper into that later. When you do oral annotation, uh, you have the original soundtrack, and let's say that's a minute 30, and then you have all these individual segments of careful speech that are longer than the original, um, original speech took. If you're going to repeat something slow and carefully, it's going to be slower and take longer. Uh, same with the oral translation. They may be shorter, they may be longer, but they're probably still going to be a little bit longer than the original soundtrack. How in the world do you align these so that if you're playing through, for example, the video with the careful speech, that everything sort of sounds right and the timing is right. One quick and dirty option would just be to align everything so that it starts at the start of the segment. And yeah, that's going to be sort of right at the beginning, but as the clip moves on, they will get more and more out of sync and you'll end up having a section without video or with dead audio when you get to the end if one is longer than the other. So it's not really ideal. 
Prestige uses the system I developed to align the different tracks by adjusting playback speed for each segment. In this case, I want to focus on the careful speech, so that will play at normal speed. The first section of careful speech turned out to be 10% longer than the original, therefore I need to play the original video 10% slower so that they start and end at the same time. The first clip of the careful speech plays, as I said, at normal speed, and the original video plays at 90% speed, and they both finish at the same time. The careful speech of the second clip was 20% longer than expected, so I need to play the original 20% slower. This continues to the end of the file. As long as the audio in focus plays smoothly, this works quite smoothly. The slowed video is hardly noticeable, and the sound, the star of the show, remains constant and doesn't sound like a chipmunk. Video with multiple audio tracks is not that unusual. You're probably going to think of a DVD um, or SAP or um, even a file where you can just choose a different audio track. But when you're watching a movie, those audio tracks have to line up perfectly, which means that uh, the people speaking in French have to speak a little faster. Or um, people speaking in another language may have to speak a little bit more slowly to arrange the timing so that it works out. So there aren't that many situations where a user is actually interacting with multiple tracks of audio that they may want to hear overlapping, stepping in an interesting way. So for this tool, I developed some unique controls. Uh, the first thing there is that big green button. Right now, that is a three-way toggle. So if you hit it the first time, it turns on. You hit it again, it turns down to a low volume, probably not low enough. And you hit it again, it turns off. And uh, you see also the three tracks of audio that are along, the, um, along there. And uh, I can click on any point in any of those audio clips, and it's going to start playing from there. And any other audio that is enabled is going to get played after. So we'll see how that goes in a little bit. So there are two main playback modes. The first playback mode is the stepped playback. Uh, you, you already saw this in Seymour. But that means that it's going to start with the first segment and play it all the way through. That's that teal segment there. Once it gets to the end of that, it jumps down to the careful speech, and it will play that segment all the way through. And then it mutes that, jumps back up to the original, and plays it again. And so it just does this stair step down of playing every audio track that is enabled. And that happens when all the audio tracks are relatively high volumes. There is a voiceover mode, um, and that was something that was important for me to test, to be able to have, for example, the careful speech playing in the background while you're listening to the original. Uh, but in general, it wasn't liked by the users. Uh, the users that I had tested, tested really couldn't see much of a need for it, uh, except maybe, maybe having just the original playing in the background incomprehensibly low so that when you're listening to the careful speech, you realize that it's a dubbing and it's not the original. Uh, another whole section is the annotation table where I've imported the text annotations, if there are any. And uh, you see these play buttons. There's a series of three play buttons on either line. Uh, that allows you to play the original recording, just that clip, the careful clip, uh, and the, trans and the trans uh, translation clip. And if you click on the transcription, it will actually play uh, it will actually play the original and the careful speech. And if you click on the translation, it will play the translation. So you always hear the segment that you just clicked on. I'm going to open Prestige. Here we are in Prestige, but it doesn't have a file open yet. So we will choose this session folder. Now it has loaded Pourquoi un maître majeur un maître source MP4. Salut à tous, dans cette nouvelle et petite série d'épisodes, nous allons faire ensemble le tour de ce qu'on appelle le système international d'unité, ou SI. Il s'agit d'un standard universel d'unité afin que partout dans le monde on puisse appeler un chat un chat. Et ce... So that's the normal playback. It's also possible to do stepped playback, where we playback two different versions. And you can compare them. Salut à tous, dans cette nouvelle et petite série d'épisodes, nous allons faire ensemble le tour de ce qu'on appelle le système international d'unité, ou SI. Salut à tous, dans cette nouvelle et petite série d'épisodes, nous allons faire ensemble le tour de ce qu'on appelle le système international d'unité, ou SI. Il s'agit d'un standard unique. And of course, it's possible to play with all three layers. 
Et ce, quelle que soit sa langue. Alors bien sûr, quand je dis partout dans le monde, c'est sans compter Myanmar, le Liberia. Ce, quelle que soit la langue. Et bien sûr, quand je dis partout dans le monde, c'est sans compter le Myanmar, le Liberia. These no matter their language. And of course, when I say everywhere in the world, that's without counting Myanmar, Liberia. It is... It's also possible to play one sound in the background while leaving the other sound loud. It sounds like a voiceover that you would hear on TV. It's a universal standard so that everywhere in the world we can call a cat a cat. And these no matter their language. And it's also possible to play any clip immediately just by clicking on it here in the annotation, annota annotation table. Il s'agit d'un standard universel d'unité afin que partout dans le monde on puisse appeler un chat un chat. Et ce, quelle que soit la langue. Et bien sûr, quand je dis partout dans le monde, c'est sans compter le Myanmar, le Liberia. Last but not least, it's possible to slow down the clips so you, you can hear them slower than normal. Standard universel unitaire afin que partout dans le monde on puisse appeler un chat un chat which makes it much easier to transcribe. So Prestige is in the prototype stage. So the prototype was developed with TypeScript uh, using a tool developed by Facebook called React.js. Uh, it re used Redux to basically for the memory of the application to remember what it was doing and be able to uh, share information between all the different bits. And I use a tool called Electron that is pretty much a packaged version of Chrome, well, Chromium, uh, that you can use to run the application on any, uh, on any operating system, well, on Windows, Mac, and Linux. We're talking desktop operating systems for the moment here. So basically, it runs as a website that is packaged inside a, uh, an application. Uh, if you've ever used Slack or several other applications out there, a lot of applications use Electron because it makes it very easy. You have one set of code, and that same code runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. I tested the prototype with three different users, and uh, so here's the summary of how that went and uh, what the results were. So my hypothesis is that a unified multimedia experience of bold data would be more useful to users than a bare folder or using Seymour itself. So the resulting null hypothesis would be that Prestige would provide no improvement beyond browsing the same content in Seymour or archive folders. So each of the three users that I uh, tested the prototype and the others with had an interest in language revitalization, but they weren't specifically in language documentation. They were in other adjacent fields. But uh, each one completed activities such as finding and playing a media in the three views. When I say three views, I mean the vanilla folder. This is just looking at it in Windows Explorer. I'm using Windows because Seymour only runs on Windows. Um, then Seymour itself. So they were navigating this and trying to find the oral annotations. It was actually very hard for them to find the oral annotations other than in the view uh, where they're all stuck together. And they tested that against the Prestige desktop prototype, which probably isn't fair. <laughs> so afterwards, after each activity, they would respond to a series of questions. So in the results, uh, Seymour's navigation was preferred. They liked being able to just click on a session, click here and open this one, click here and open this one, because you could see at a glance, oh, this is what, uh, these are what are the files that are available, which is fair. Prestige doesn't have that part built yet. Um, you have to choose a folder, and then once you're in that session folder, you can't really navigate out of it without choosing another one. Um, they really liked the linking of the video with the annotations. They said that as soon as you added the video back to the annotations, the careful speech of the translation, it became much more engaging, and that was definitely preferred to other experiences. They liked the stepped audio experience. Uh, where it goes you know, original, careful, translation, original, careful, translation. But the voiceover mode was too confusing, too loud, and didn't seem useful for them. And even though I only had a very small library of files for them to play with, they really enjoyed playing with Prestige even after the activities were over.
So unsurprisingly, the users were excited about the media experience, but they were a little concerned that it would be limited to des desktop users. They're thinking of the mama in the village um, and somebody that has a smartphone and doesn't have a, uh, a computer. So they were thinking, yeah, okay, well, we've got to have a web version and we've got to have a smartphone version of this. But then one of them realized, hmm, how are we going to get all that data onto the smartphone? It might be pretty big. But one thing they really liked was the idea of video export. So you could use Prestige to configure and choose the audio if you're a trainer, if you're a literacy worker, um, if you are a language teacher, and set it up the way you want it with all the, uh, all the clips playing as you want, and then export that. And as soon as, uh, if you're following all of your digital rights management and you have permission from everyone along the line, very important, then uh, you would be able to take that video and put it up on YouTube, put it up on Vimeo, some other site where you would be adding video. At this point, they don't need the interface of Prestige to be able to play with all the volume and things because everything has just been compressed down to a single stereo track where the video plays and uh, plays as it should. So conclusions. Uh, I'm really excited that the current prototype can already be built for Windows, Mac, and Linux. And the prototype imports those raw Say More sessions from the local folders. So you actually have to have those folders on your computer. So as soon as you have finished your, uh, a day of your documentation, you can sit down with some of the users and you can go through the dailies as they would do on a, um, on a movie set. And so you can have them play back everything that you've recorded through the day and uh, people will have the time to make comments, look at it again and say, oh, uh, what, wait a minute, or have even further discussions that, um, that you can record and use for the, um, for the language documentation. Uh, it is possible to run this prototype as a website. I actually had to do that to uh, do the testing, but once you put it on a website, you're not allowed to access the user's computer uh, in most cases. So it, the website would be reading prepackaged sessions uh, those would be sessions that are already compressed down to low quality audio and video and uh, have been added to a library. And the, uh, the automatic, automatic synchronization of the oral and the video, it's really effective. It works really well because uh, after, after a moment, you don't really realize that you're listening to, um, to something that wasn't recorded and wasn't timed differently. Uh, when you slow down uh, a video, small amounts, most of the time, unless you were doing something very continuous across the screen, for example, uh, you're not going to notice because the audio overpower in your brain, the audio overpowers and you see, um, you see and hear everything coming in at the same time. At least it's better than the worst Godzilla dubbing. Um, that pretty much was my goal to have it better than a Godzilla movie uh, where the audio finishes considerably after the text or, 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 um, or the other way around. So as far as going forwards, the near-term goal is to enable the export of the compiled video with the subtitles, as I mentioned, um, so that you could post it on YouTube, Vimeo, or social media. Um, I actually have most of that finished, but it didn't, the, didn't make it into the final version of the prototype that I was testing. Uh, I will probably remove uh, or hide voiceover mode, and that's actually going to make the navigation of the, of the app very much easier, because then you only have the volume controls, and uh, you don't need uh, to know, you don't need the, um, well, it was just a little bit too easy to turn on voiceover mode when you didn't really mean to. Um, I definitely intend to add a more complete session chooser and um, more user-defined categories to avoid having to, the user having to go back and look in a folder, and of course lots of bug fixes and uh, wider release. I actually was able to fix three bugs after the testing before this date. So what are the uses of Prestige? Uh, one of the main uses that I'm hoping for is language and culture learning. Um, I can really see this being used on a computer sitting in the classroom for multilingual education, for heritage schools, and for encouraging, engaging the diaspora. If uh, you are living in another country, but you really want your child, uh, your teenager, for example, to learn about the culture where they came from, then this is going to be really ideal. That child may not be able to understand the original language, but they can still learn through the English, through the French, through whatever the uh, language of wider communication is about their home culture. And 
you can use this to create multilingual promotional materials. If you have a video recording and you want to put that video out in several languages and it's okay if the uh, video slows down slightly, you may be able to create a draft with this. Um, one of the interesting things that Bold does is that you can actually recover bad source recordings. It's not that it's cleaning up the source recording, but you actually re-record all of the audio and really the audio only has to be good enough that a native, native speaker or a qualified speaker can listen to it, figure out what was said, and be able to repeat it segment by segment. And lastly, maybe this could be used for uh, aligning rough drafts of massively multi multilingual videos like the Jesus film or the Lumo film. I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but it could be something that could be used to create a rough draft so that people can see it, um, just or a draft of it before it's produced. Yeah, maybe it would be good enough. I don't know. So my hope is that language documentation with Prestige is going to, is going to become a community-oriented process. So the speakers will share and share stories and songs during the documentation. The performances will be recorded in video or audio. Those recordings get bold, annotated, and translated in Seymour, which doesn't take as long as written transcription. And the raw data and annotations are, of course, archived and made safe for future generations. After that, the community can take that content and reorganize it and choose what parts they want to use for, um, for lessons. They can tag it and import it into Prestige. And that multi multimedia content can be used interactively or at home or at home or in the classroom for heritage and language learning. 